Good, Good morning. We're working this week. Yes. All right. God does answer prayer for sure. Good to see everyone here this morning. How's everyone doing? Peachy. Oh, we're back to that. I did not miss that. <laughs> Again, it's good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, just, a, just a couple of announcements uh, before we get started. Uh, the first one is that I just want you guys to know, if you have small kids um, in the service, listen, if they talk, if they move around the aisles, if they, it, it doesn't bother me. Okay, I had my daughter up here last week answering every rhetorical question that I asked. Okay, and it doesn't bother me. This, I'm just happy you guys are here. So we're going to try to keep it fun while holding our reverence for the Lord. How, does that sound okay? So let's just, let's just relax and have a good time worshiping the Lord. Um, also, our retreat, our Camp Reach All Church retreat, uh, mark your calendars for the end of August, August 28th, 29th, and 30th. Is that correct? I think so, yeah. It's the last weekend in August, so mark your calendars for that, and we'll be getting more information about that and the sign-up sheets back up um, out in the Welcome Center uh, for you to sign up for things. Other than that, make sure you're checking the website, checking Facebook, um, checking email, those kind of things for announcements. And if you have prayer requests, make sure you just let me know those things so we can get people praying for those. Um, speaking of which, let's keep in prayer uh, Mabel uh, Barner went to visit her this week. Uh, she's home and under hospice care. So let's just continue to pray for her and uh, lift her up. Uh, for those of you who don't know, she um, has stage 4 pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, and liver cancer. Uh, so she's home. I went and saw her. We had a long conversation. She wanted you to know uh, that she's not afraid, that she has trust in her Lord, and he, he, she knows that he is faithful. So and whenever he decides to take her home, she'll go and worship him for eternity. So she wanted you to know that, and thank you for the prayers on her behalf. So again, welcome. Thank you guys for coming this morning. Let's pray and give the service over to the Lord. Father God, I thank you uh, so much for today. God, I thank you for your son. God, I thank you for our faith. God, I thank you for the hope that we have in you. God, I thank you for family. God, I thank you just for, <laughs> just for everything you give us. Lord, there's so many things that we take for granted. God, I thank you for, um, Lord, for our sister Mabel. God, what a rock. God, what a... What a testimony uh, she is, and, and Chuck, and, and Michelle, and Melissa, and the rest of the family. God, I just pray now, Lord, you would just um, watch over her, Lord. Lord, that you would touch her body, God, that you would touch her spirit. God, that you would keep her comfortable, that you would encourage her. I thank you for her life, God. I thank you for her hope and faith in you. God, as we worship you this morning and we sing songs, we hear from your word, God, I pray, Lord, anything that's distracting us this morning, God, anything that is coming between um, us and you, God, that we put it aside. God, so we can have our eyes fixated only on you and worship you this morning. God, we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Whew. It is so good. This is um, the first week where we didn't actually record ahead of time, um, so I didn't have the bright, shining light in my face. Um, but in case anyone is wondering when you go home, um, we are recording this sermon right now, uh, so it should air around 12 o'clock, um, around lunchtime. So if you want to watch it again or <laughs> if you want to tell someone, uh, about 12 o'clock it should be, be airing. So... This morning, we are continuing our Above and Beyond series, and actually, we are ending our Above and Beyond series this week, and throughout this whole series, we have been talking about how God not only meets our needs, God doesn't only give us what we need, but in so many cases, he goes above and beyond. Like, we have this idea of, okay, God, if you can just do this, that'd be great, but then not only does God do that, but then he just blesses even more. Right? And we've talked about the feeding of the 5,000. We, we've, um, we've talked about a whole bunch of different things. And this morning we are going to be looking at a, a, an Old Testament account in Scripture. It's one that maybe you've heard of. Um, but we're gonna, if you haven't, you're going to hear about it this morning. You know, there was a well-known theologian. He was, asked the, he was asked one day to prove the existence of God. Prove the existence of God. And he said, I can do that with two words. The Jew. And what he meant by that was, if you look throughout history, 
the Jewish people, many nations have been attempting to destroy God's people since the beginning of time. You know, it started off with the, with the Egyptian, Egyptian Empire, then the Philistines and the Assyrians and the Babylonian Empire and the Byzantine Empire and the Greek Empire, the Spanish Empire. We saw Nazi Germany and Russia over and over again. Nations trying to destroy God's people. Even today, Israel is surrounded by nations that seek to destroy them. And miraculously, God's people always stand tall. There's no other nation that has as many enemies as the Jewish people, but they stand tall. They stand proud. And today, we're going to look at one of those attempts at wiping out God's people. We're going to be in the book of Esther this morning. And we're going to look at how God went above and beyond. Because many of us know the story of Esther. But we're going to look at not only did God meet the needs of the Jewish people, but he went above and beyond. This book of Esther was recorded about 480 B.C. during the reign of Xerxes, um, who was the king of the Persian Empire. Now, during this time, there were some Jews who were allowed to go home to reestablish and rebuild in Jerusalem, but many were exiled to Persia. And now the setting of our story takes place in the palace of Susa, which is the capital of Persia. And now we have some main characters in the story. Can you maybe turn this down a little bit? Uh, we have some main characters in the story. We have uh, King Xerxes. We have Esther. We have Esther's uncle Mordecai. And we have the villain of our story. Because every good story has a villain. Right? Every good movie has a villain. And our villain in this case is Haman. Now to give you a little background of Haman. Haman was a descendant of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were the first tribe to oppose Israel from approaching the promised land. The Amalekites hated the Jews. And this went back for centuries. And not only did Haman hate the Jews, but he specifically hated the Jews because there was a Jewish man that was part of the king's guards. His name was Mordecai. And Haman hated that a Jew had any kind of power. They're Jews. They're nothing. And he couldn't stand that. And there was one time, you know, everyone would, you know, as Haman, the pri royal prime minister, would walk down the streets, right? Everyone would bow down. All the Jewish people, everyone would bow down to Haman because of his position in the court, except for one person. Mordecai would never bow down to Haman. He said, I only bow down to my God, and I'm pretty sure you're not him. And this infuriated Haman to the point where he had to come up with a plan. Haman had to come up with a plan. He came up with a plan that would make it possible for him to kill Mordecai legally. And not only kill Mordecai, but to wipe out the rest of the Jews as well. He made it so it was legal to murder every single one of them. Haman convinced King Xerxes that these exiled Jews that were all around would one day rise up. And they would seek power over the king. They would rise up and overthrow the king. So he said, king, we have to get rid of them. We have to get rid of all of these Jews. We have to. Or they're going to overthrow you. And he said, in fact, after we get rid of them, you can have all their stuff. All the gold, all the treasures. King, it's yours. And the king, he was just, I don't care what you do. Just do what you have to do. And this is what he says in Esther chapter 3, verse 11. He says, the money and the people are both yours to do what you see fit. Just do what you want to do. That's a good king, huh? He doesn't care. He just says, as long as I'm king, as long as I have what I want, you feel free to do whatever you want. So they gave him a signet ring, and this basically represented the king's approval. So when everyone saw that Haman was wearing this king, basically Haman could do whatever he wanted because he had the approval of the king. So he sent out this royal decree that all Jews on a certain day, all these Jews in Persia, would be killed. That any Persian could go out and kill a Jew, and it would be fine. It would be perfectly legal. Sounds awful. Sounds terrible. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's awful. And, you know, so, and not only could he kill all the Jews, but he could take all their stuff. So you pick a certain day for this. Now you have 127 provinces of, of Persia surrounding from Egypt to India getting ready to pounce on the Jewish people. This is not a good sign for the Jews. Right? This is not a good sign for God's people. This decree was meant to completely wipe out God's people. Now, it's hard to explain 
why God's people have been under such scrutiny and such duress and such persecution since the beginning of time. But all I know is this is always Satan's plan. It's always Satan's plan to wipe out God's people. I mean, think of the, the struggles that we go through and the, the, the temptations that we suffer and the sin that we get involved in. You know, Satan knows that he can't have our soul because that belongs to God. But man, if he can wound us, man, if he could knock us off course, you know, if this is a spiritual battle, if he could put us in the infirmary and make us ineffective, man, that's what he wants to do. He wants God's name to be wiped out. So that's why we see this over and over and over again with God's people. But Haman's plan to wipe out the Jews never came to pass. It never came to pass because God all this time is setting things in motion, setting a plan in motion that is going to rescue his people, that's going to save his people. And he uses the brave actions of the heroine of our story, Esther, to do so. So that gives you some background of where we're at. So let's talk about Esther. Esther was one of these Jewish girls that was exiled, a young, a young Jewish girl. And the way she rose to become queen of Persia is like a fairy tale. It's like, it's like if you're watching Cinderella. It, it was basically a Disney movie before there was Disney. Okay, she was just this, this average Jewish girl. And she rose to power. Why? Because the king had exiled his first wife. There's two things you don't do. We're going to talk about this later. There's two things you don't do. When the king summons you, you don't ignore that. Right? And what happened was his first wife, Queen Vashti, was summoned and she said, eh, I don't feel like going. So, you're gone. I'll find a new wife. I don't need you. So basically he says, any young woman in the land, I want them at my palace so I can choose a new wife. This was the, this was the bachelor for this time. All right? So all of these single young women come to the palace, and the king holds a competition. And Mordecai, realizing that, hey, you know, my, my niece is, is a beautiful young lady, and maybe she should enter this contest, because if she would win, she could have Jew Jewish influence, right, with the king, and maybe help our people. So Esther joins a contest, wins the contest, and becomes queen of Persia. Several years later, Mordecai comes back to Esther with a, with a desperation, uh, a plea. Because Mordecai had heard about this, this royal death warrant that Haman had put out. And says, Esther, you have to do something. You have to do something because our people are going to die. You have to go before the king and tell him to cancel the decree. And remember I said there's two things you do not do. When this king summons you, you do not ignore it. But you also do not go before the king without being summoned. If you do that, you will die. It's simple. Go before the king, he doesn't summon you, he will die. So to the queen, to Esther, this was mission impossible. You know, there's no way I can go before the queen, or go before the king. I am the queen. There's no way I can go before the king. Because I will die. Esther would be breaking every protocol. And Esther tells Mordecai, listen, if I do what you're asking, I will sign my own death warrant. I will be dead. And listen to what Mordecai says. There are so many amazing things in the Mordecai's response. Okay? Esther says, if I do what you're asking, I'm signing my own death warrant. And this is what Esther says. Esther chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. It says, don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. There are so many things I want to pull out of there. The first one is where he says, listen, don't think for a moment that because you're in, a, in the palace, you're going to escape this when all the Jews are killed. You're going to be killed right along with them. Because if you do not speak up, God will raise someone else up to deliver the Jews. Right? And we see that throughout scripture. Just an example that pops over in my head. We have Saul. Didn't obey God. God rose up David. 
God will find someone to do what we are not willing to do. God gives us opportunities to serve. God gives us opportunities for blessing. And if we do not take advantage of that, if we do not participate with what God is doing, he'll say, okay, next one up. Now, if, you're in, if you watch sports, next one up. Someone gets hurt, okay, we're not going to bow our, you know, we're not going to lower our heads. Next one up, let's go. God will find someone else to do what we are not willing to do. God has called us to do amazing, incredible things. And he says, listen, you are not going to escape this just by keeping silent. Because you're going to die with the rest of us. But then he says, who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. This Jewish girl, out of all the women in the land that were brought to the palace, this Jewish girl becomes queen. Why? Why? I mean, have you ever been in a situation where you were thinking, man, how did, how did this, when I, you know, I went through this, I'm going through this, I'm, you know, I've gone through this, how do I connect the dots? Why am I in this situation? Why did this happen that led me to here, that led me to here? Maybe you're in the position you're in for such a time as this. Maybe there's someone that God wants you to speak to. Maybe there's someone God wants you to minister to. Maybe there's someone God wants to put in your life. And that's why you're where you're at at this moment. God does not work in coincidences. I truly believe that. And as you continue to read the story, you're going to see that there's no coincidences. God has a plan. And we are not going to thwart God's plan. God's plan is going to be God's plan. The question is, are we going to go along for the ride? Are we going to allow God to use us? I want God to use me for his glory. I want God to use me for his big plans. Now, I mess up, I screw up, and sometimes God's plan is right in front of my face, and I do something completely contrary to his word, or I sin, or I do something. And we miss that. We miss the blessing. But he says, Esther, you're not going to get away from this. Maybe this is why you're queen. Maybe God has called you for this reason. So Esther asked Mordecai to have all the Jews of Susa fast for three days while she and her maids did the same. She had the people fast. That's something we don't talk about often. Now, I know during our online prayer night, we talked about fasting one week, and we talked about doing a study on fasting and why we fast, because I know I've gotten a lot of questions on why do we fast? What is the point of it? Because you always see fasting and praying together. When you read scripture, it's always fast and pray, fast and pray, pray and fast. What is it? We think of it as just, oh, I'm just not going to eat today. <laughs> it's a little more than that. Why aren't you eating? Why are you giving whatever it is up? You know, it's because we give up eating. So anytime during the day we're hungry, we say, God, I'm going to you for my substance. I'm God, I'm going to you for strength. I don't need a sandwich. I don't need food today. God, I just need you. God, I'm focusing completely and utterly on you today. And we can go to a whole, we'll have a whole, you know, series or a whole, um, you know, uh, messages on that later. But he says, go and fast. And this is what Esther says. And, the, and then, after the fasting, though it is against the law, I will go see the king, and if I must die, I must die. Look how her attitude completely changed in not that long period of time. All right? If I do what you're asking, I'll be signing my own death warrant. I don't really don't want to die. All right. Go fast, and fine. You're right. If I have to die, I'll have to die. But I'm going to serve my God. I'm not afraid to serve my God. And if it costs me my life, so be it. I'm not afraid. So we know what Esther does. Esther goes before the king. She opens the doors to the king's courts. Completely illegal. Completely against protocol. And she should have been executed immediately. She starts walking up to the king. And right before she could be killed, the king you know, extends his scepter, offering her mercy. Basically, that's what that means. And the king can do that with anyone he pleases for any purpose. He can extend mercy. And he does that for Esther. Esther does not get killed. So there's two things right off the bat that are like, wow, what a coincidence. This is really strange. First, we just happen to have a Jewish woman become queen during a time where her people are going to be wiped out. Then she goes before the king. When everyone else that's ever done that has been killed, she is not. She's not killed. She's spared. And the king asks, what do you want? What can I do for you? 
And she says, well, probably he wasn't anticipating. She says, I want to have a banquet for you and for Haman. You risked your life for food? <laughs> like, he's probably like, what are you doing? Right? So she's like, yeah, that's fine. And now the story, go, the story tells that Haman was, would go home after this and brag to his family. Because Haman's plan is working exactly the way he wanted it to. Not only is he one of the highest officials in Persia, now he gets this private meal with the king and queen. He's thinking, man, I'm hot stuff. My plan is going exactly the way I want it to go. So we have talked about the villain. We've talked about Haman. We've talked about our heroine. We've talked about Esther. Now let's look at the director of this whole thing. And that's God. Because during this whole time, God is behind the scenes setting up the stage that Haman and not even Esther could imagine what God was about to do. You know, this is the point of the whole series that we've been doing this month. That God, you know, we, God does something. We think, wow, thank you, Lord. That's great. But then he, again, he takes it a step further. When, I mean, have you guys ever had, had your mind completely blown about what God has done? Like, God, not only did you do this, but you did this. Have you ever seen Facing the Giants? The movie Facing the Giants? At the end of the movie, I'm not going to quote it right, but, you know, you know the, the coach, he, he goes through a lot of bad stuff, and a lot of good stuff happens. So, you know, that's the premise of the movie. He follows God, and God changes his life. At the end of the movie, he says, you know, he, you know God did it. He, he, fixed, you know, he gave us our house. He gave us a new truck. You know, he, he did all these things. He took away my fear. He gave me my job. And he throws in a football state championship just because he can. You know, just that above and beyond. Just because he can, he throws that in. And that's when he finds, oh, if you haven't seen it, I won't tell you. All right, I don't want to give a spoiler alert. I'll give, that's as much as I'm going to tell you. But the idea is that God just throws through that in, you know, just because he can. And that's what we're going to see here in the story. So let's see what happens. Something really cool happens before the banquet, or the, the, the night after um, this whole situation with the king. The king has insomnia. The king cannot sleep. So he asks one of his attendants to bring the book of the history of the king's reign. So basically what he wants is the attendant to come into his room and read how amazing the king is. He wants to, him to read how amazing he is. So read me the history of me. <laughs> you know, that's what he wants. So the attendant just opens up to a page, and he just happened to open up the page to a portion that dealt with Mordecai, the Jew, Esther's uncle. And it was a point in, in that time where Mordecai had heard two people fighting, or not fighting, had heard two people planning an assassination on the king. So Mordecai reports it and ultimately saves the king's life. Man, what are the odds of that? This is what happened. This is what the king says. What reward or recognition did we ever give Mordecai for this? His attendants replied, nothing has been done for him. Who is it? And then he looks out and he says, who is that in the outer court? The king inquired. As it happened, just, as it just happened to be, Haman just arrived in the outer court of the palace to ask the king to hang Mordecai on the pole he had prepared. Had prepared. Now there's a lot of coincidences here. First of all, the king just happened to have insomnia. The attendant just happened to open the page of Mordecai. And Haman just happened to be in the palace, walking around. Haman was on his way to ask the king if he could kill Mordecai on a pole that he made. So, the, uh, so this is what happens. The king asks Haman, Haman, what reward should I give someone who has pleased me? See, the king is trying to figure out, how can I bless, how can I reward Mordecai for saving my life? So he says, what can I do for someone who has pleased me? And of course, Haman thinks, oh, wait, the king's talking about me. Oh, this is even better than I thought. And he says, oh, this is easy, king. Dress him in the finest robes, put him on a royal horse, march him down the street, and have your, your servants say, this is what happens to the person that is honored by the king. This person is honored by the king. March him down the street in a parade and honor him over and over again. And the king's like, great idea. He's like, I want you to do all of that to Mordecai. And Haman, you can just, oh, again, I, I, I watch movies a lot, so you can almost see Haman says, he, oh. 
So Haman goes from, can I kill Mordecai, to now dressing up him up in royal garments, putting him on a horse, and marching him down the street saying, this is a man that the king is honored with. Oh, can you imagine the hatred and the anger going through Haman at this time? I mean, he's so, probably so livid. But he's probably thinking in the back of his mind, oh, you know what, let him have his moment, because soon they're all going to die. He can have his moment. So now we get to the banquet. And once again, the king says, okay, Esther, what do you really want? Because I know this banquet, you, you could have approached me to ask for just to have a meal, because we could have done that anyway. So what is the purpose? What is the point? And this is what she says. It says, if I have found favor with the king... And if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had merely been sold as slaves, I would, could remain quiet, but for that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. She's a king, listen, you got to save my people. You have to save us. If we were just slaves in Persia, I wouldn't have said anything. But we are about to be annihilated. annihilated, And we, I can't have that. I couldn't keep that quiet. And so the king says, who would do this? And I, you know, as I look at him, ultimately I'm like, you did, king, because you didn't care earlier. But she's like, who, he's like, who did this? And she reports, it was Haman. Haman has set this whole thing up. Haman is trying to kill us. And this infuriates the king. You're going to kill my queen? You're going to kill the woman that I love? I don't think so. Not on my watch. And so one of his eunuchs comes and says, you know, there's a pole outside that Haman was going to kill Mordecai on and hang Mordecai on. And the king said, eh, change of plans. We're going to hang Haman on that pole. So Haman is killed. Haman is hung. And so that should be the end of the story, right? That should be it. What else is there? You have a group, you have the Jews about to be annihilated. Esther wins the bachelor, becomes queen of Persia, and not only becomes queen of Persia, goes before the king, is not killed, gets the king to kill the person who was going to kill her people. Her people are saved. End of story, right? That would be enough. That would be, God, thank you for meeting our needs. But that is not the end of the story. Because here's where God goes above and beyond. Because the king's decree could not be taken back. He could not say, never mind, I, I renege on what I said earlier. So he adds a second decree. Any Jew that feels like their life is being harmed, if there are any Jew that feels like someone is about to harm them, they can fight back. And they should fight back against anyone who seeks to kill them or harm them. Because before, it was, we're going to kill you, you're either going to accept it, or we're going to take you to the palace, arrest you, and kill you. Like, there was no other thing. Now the king says, no, fight back against them. And guess what the Jews do? They fight back. And not only do they fight back, they win decisively. They destroy their enemy. They rise up against their enemy. This is God going way above and beyond. And that's the part of the story we don't hear about very often. We usually end with, with Esther going before the king. But the fact is God allowed his people to rise up ultimately against the enemy. So God's people went from being annihilated to rising up and taking care of business. You know, and as we, as we look at this story, there's a couple questions that come to my mind. First says, what is God asking you to do? What is God asking me to do? That we might look at and say, God, that is scary. God is scary. And maybe it's not go before the king. Maybe it's not something that huge. Maybe something little. Maybe God is saying, you know, and this isn't a shameless plug. I'm just kind of making examples. Maybe God wants you to teach a Sunday school class. Maybe God wants you to get involved in the life of the church somehow, some way. And God, I don't know. I don't know if I'm capable. God, I don't know if I'm, but God wants you to do that. Maybe God is asking you, hey, you know that guy at work? You know that woman at work? You know that kid at school? Do you know, do you know that person that you see every day? They don't know Jesus. I want you to share the gospel with them. God, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not as equipped as you think, God. And maybe they'll persecute me. Maybe they'll make fun of me. God, you don't understand. What is God asking us to do for such a time as this? 
What is, where has God placed you? Maybe you're in a place in your life, you're like, I never thought I'd be in this position. Could it possibly be there's a reason that you're in the position that you're in? Is there someone you can minister to? Something that God wants you to do? And I truly believe even when we sin, even when we go against God, God can still use that. God can turn beauty from ashes. God can do whatever he wants. We're just called to remain faithful. Such a time as this. And then we got to say, you know what? In a sense, if I die, I die. If I'm persecuted, I'm persecuted. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And watch, watch. I guarantee you. I don't guarantee too many things because I personally can't do that. But I guarantee you when you put your faith and trust in God and let him do the work in you, he will blow your mind and he will go above and beyond even what our expectations are. He will show you this is what originally what I had for you and this is good, but I want to show you even more. And sometimes we don't let God show us the more. Sometimes we don't even let God show us the initial blessing. If we want to see the extra, if we want to see the overflow of blessings that God has in our lives, we first have to tr have trust and faith in him to let him do the plan he had originally planned out for us. We can't live saying, God, I trust you and I, I, want, you know, I want all these things. God, I, I, I trust you. I have faith in you. And then he asks us to do something. And say, eh, God, I'm sorry. Not going to happen. We see that so many times in scripture. Remember when they went to go to the promised land? He went to the promised land. God said, all you got to do is go into the promised land. God, there's giants in this land. I know there's giants in this land. Just go. Now, God, there's giants. I'm bigger than a giant. <laughs> no, God, I'm sorry. Fine. Then guess what? Enjoy the desert. And some of us are in the desert because we had failed to do what God had asked us to do. But eventually we'll get to the promised land. So we need to ask ourselves those questions. What is God calling us to do? What blessings do we want to see in our lives? And just like Esther, Esther was just a Jewish girl who had faith and trust in her God, and amazing things happened. And God wants the same thing for you. He wants the same thing for me. He wants the same thing for all of his people. The question is, are you going to let him do it? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this morning. God, I thank you for, for Esther. God, just for the example. God, we, we thank you for her faith. God, we see the struggle and the turmoil that she had. God saying, listen, if I do this, I'm going to die. God, we saw the fear. God, we saw the hesitation, God, to do what you were calling her to do. But God, then we see it all change. God, we see her say, you know what? I'm going to give this over to the Lord. I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. And then we see her mentality completely change. And then if I die, I die. And God, we see the amazing things that you have done. God, not only did you save your people, but you, God, you allowed them to rise above the enemy, which was no small feat. So God, I pray, Lord, for our lives, God, that no matter what we're facing, God, no matter what, what giants we're facing, God, no matter what, in a sense, what other king we're facing, no matter what protocol we're facing, God, and even if we're looking death in the face, God, the question we need to ask ourselves is, am I going to trust and follow you no matter what happens, no matter what comes my way, no matter the persecution, no matter what the naysayers say, God, it doesn't matter because all that matters is that I serve you and I walk in your footsteps. God, I pray, Lord, you would bless us all today and as we leave here, God, to do your work. God, to do what you've called us to do. And God, watch you blow our minds in the middle of all of it. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.